Give our spirits, Lord, to your spirit. That we know your voice. That we hear your voice. That we act upon your voice. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let them be aware. Let them be aware of your presence, Lord, of the anointing. The anointing, Father God, that flows. The anointing that flows through our lives. The anointing that destroys every yoke of bondages. Thank you, Father God, as bondages are being destroyed now in Jesus' name. Bondages being destroyed now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Praise, praise, praise. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Praise God. Are you excited about Jesus? Yeah. Hallelujah. I think we got some. I think we got some people that are um, that started Thanksgiving already. With their families. Some went to be their families. Hopefully, hopefully they're not just sitting at home. You know, we need we need desperate people. God is looking for desperate people, desperate for Him because He's getting ready. God, I'm a, I'm gonna tell you. I've said it before. God is up to something, and and if you want to partake of that, then you get you got to make that choice because He's up to something. There's things that are taking place. God, things are happening. I'm not just saying here in the church. I'm saying here in our country, in the world. Praise the Lord. God, I, I feel like God's been silent long enough and it's going to come suddenly. Bible, Read the Bible. It talks about suddenly, suddenly, suddenly. Suddenly it's happened. Suddenly when the, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit took place, that outpouring is still available to us today. It's still flowing. It's still flowing. You got to partake in it. Don't wait. You don't go and say, well, we just want revival. You got to get revived yourself. That's where it starts. And, and the, revival, the revival is there for the, for the taking. As you partake of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Say I want the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Say I want the Holy Ghost to work in my life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to turn to somebody before you're seated and just say, I'm so glad that you're here with us this morning. When, when, when they can't, when I, I can't do anything about it when they can't hear me. I can't. All right, brother. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I know that Tiffany and Deborah are out with another church. They're speaking there regarding the, the Covenant House, uh, BTC. So we're aware of that. And all. we're not aware of the others. <laughs> but uh, I'm here. You're here. And uh, we're going to partake of what God has for us this morning. Are you ready for Thanksgiving? Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't, huh? Don't, I don't, I, I hope I didn't hear. Don't say uh, happy turkey. Because then you're a turkey. Uh, it's not about turkey. It's not about, it's not about going in and, uh, Give them what you get and get all filled up and diets go out the window and you just, whatever. We got that? I'll have that too. I'll have that too. I'll have that too. And get it all and get all stuffed up and just sit back and, and it's like, ah, I, ate the, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. And then you're, and then after that you get tired, you know, and stuff. And then after, a few hours later, it says, oh, I'll step up to the table again and have some more. And it's, it's all about eating. It's not about eating. It's about celebration. 
It's about having an, an attitude of, of gratitude. You know, having a, a thankful heart, which we're supposed to have all the time, right? We're supposed to have all the time, being thankful. And I just, I just stop and oftentimes I'll just stop and think about, in fact, last night I was listening to some uh, songs from, uh, this is the era I came from right, way back years ago. Uh, we have, uh, uh, what's the name of them, Bill Gaither, and he uh, has a lot of their singing, a whole group of people, and once in a while they'll hand the mic over and they'll stand up and just sing, sing these songs and phew, I mean, it's blasted out there, and all. Now we're just sitting there, just worshiping God, and just you know, tears coming down, just, just, in, just enjoying it, and all. And I said, man, look at these days. Now we're going to go into greater days, actually. I know sometimes we think about the old days, the good days, and all that. No, you know what? We got better days ahead of us, because the outpouring it pours, and it keeps pouring. And, and as it goes down, farther, farther down, it goes faster and faster. And, and if you notice, life, life is moving f at a fast rate. Okay, God's not staying behind with his people and say, okay, we've got to catch up. No, no, all truth is parallel. What goes on in the natural is already going on in the spiritual. It, it, just, it just depends on what part you're going to be, uh, uh, what, what part you're going to be a part of, let's say. You know, you could be a part of what's happening in the natural or you can be a part of what's happening in the spiritual. I think I'd be a part of what's happening in the spiritual. Yeah. Then there's things that we need to do to get, to get lined up because it doesn't just happen. Have you noticed that salvation doesn't just happen, right? You have to do something. You know, you have to have an action of faith. Uh, so I don't know what happens to Christians today, but they go and they, and they act on salvation and, uh, and, and then they stop. They stop acting. They stop, they stop moving. And so if you don't move in the spirit, you're backsliding. Because you automatically start moving in the flesh, into the natural. We're supposed to be always moving forward. We're not supposed to lag behind. God is on the move. He's a moving God. That's why the Bible says the just shall live by faith. Faith is a walk. Praise God. It's a walk. And if you don't walk, you'll backslide and get caught into sins where you came from. And that's an insult to God. Right? It's an insult. You know, it's, it's getting the blood of Jesus and treading all over it, walking all over it. He says, ha, 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 Jesus, I'm walking on you. Whoa. That's dangerous. Because if you're caught walking on it, I don't care if you're a Christian. See, I believe once saved, always saved, but only if you're going after it. See, because the thing is, there's people that think it's once saved, always saved. Well, I'm all right. There are Christians today that say, well, they accepted, you know, somebody that dies and they die, died in their sins. But then they say, and I, they'll say, uh, uh, well, that when they were a little, little girl, little boy, you know, they, they, accepted, they accepted Jesus when they were, in the, when they were younger. And says, oh, that, that's a done deal then, huh? If that's a done deal, then we're wasting time read, uh, studying the Word. It's just a waste of time. You know, because, hey, you received Jesus? We all received Jesus? Okay, let's just go on and just go on with life and live the best we can, you know, and, and all, and live in our sins and stuff. And it's okay because I received Jesus. One saved, always saved. And those that talk that way or those that believe that way, and there's denominations that believe that way, those that believe that way, they just look at it and, and say, oh, it's because they never got saved. Really? Then it's really hard to get saved. Because I'm sure there are a lot of people that are sincere when they get saved and they go and they say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. And then they go back, and, back into the world and, and start playing around the things of the world again and saying, oh, it's okay. You know why? It's all right. You know why? Because I received Jesus then there's no need of my kind of ministry and others, other preachers that teach you how to live holy, how to live upright, how to come out from among them and be separate. As even, even in the Old Testament and New Testament, and Jesus even quoted it. 
He says, be holy. As I am holy. Holy is a separated life. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, I believe I'm saved. And I'm always saved. I'm always going to be saved. Because it's my choice. It's my choice to live the way God wants me to live. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's all for free. Amen. Here, this part I'm going to teach you is going to, co it's going to cost you. Because I'm going to meddle in your life. <laughs> well, what the heck? I mean, God meddles in my life. Why can't I meddle in yours? You know what I mean by meddling? I mean by making you, making you live, or, or actually provoking you to live. I can't make you. To provoking you to live right. To come out from your sins and stay out. Let me tell you, that's why Jesus says, when an unclean spirit leaves a person, and, and then you go back into the world. Those demons, that demon that preoccupied our lives, okay, he sees that it's swept and garnished. It's all cleaned up. So he, don't want, he wants to come back in, but he's not coming back alone. He's coming back with others. So it'll be seven, that person's st state of their mind. I know it doesn't happen right away, but it does happen. That person becomes seven times worse. And there, you got that close to the gospel? Guess what? They're going to make sure you don't get that close again, ever again. So if they work so hard to make that happen, that means once saved, always saved. It's a false doctrine. Why would, they, why would they work hard? Why would they work against us? Demons work against us. Devils work against us. If he goes, oh, forget it, man. They confess he's as their Savior. Ha! Uh, we, can't do, we can't do anything about it, so we're going to go find people that haven't yet. No. Why is it? Why is it that the devil is after the believer? Why is it that we are in his hit list? Why is it? Because he knows that we can lose and make hell our home. He knows that. <laughs> and he's a master war at warfare. And we are, no, we are no match to him when we are outside in disobedience. We're no match to him. But when we're walking in obedience, he's no match with us. Amen. Because the Bible says the believer is not to be ignorant of his devices. And he is very divisive. He's a master tactical in warfare. Praise God. This stuff is real and we cannot play with it. As my sister was saying, we cannot play with it. This is, like I said last Sunday, this is the time for the church. The church of Jesus Christ. This is the time. Now, because of the elections, we have a window of opportunity. Okay. They're go we're going to have a safeguard of the Christian world. If it went the other way, we would have had, we would have been in trouble. Because it was our rights were totally being taken away for the last eight years, been taken away. Wake up. Wake up. It's been taken away. Okay. And their, their goal was to, and most, a lot of Christians don't, didn't know this, but their goal was to dissolve us, put us totally, totally to the side. That's the reason why it's become, it has become a godless nation. Come on, when you have, when you say, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, oh, don't say God. Wow, really, we've done it all these years, and all of a sudden, what is this? And Christians are sleeping and standing by and, well, well, you know, they have their right of opinion. No, they have a right of opinion, but don't take mine away. And that's what they've been doing. And so this is the reason why, and God showed me this right at the beginning of the year, that he says, now we got that window there. It's there. Remember I said that way back? Huh? I said, it's, it, now we got it. That doesn't mean that we kick back. That means that we better get in. Well, the going is good. 
because there is coming a time that persecution is coming to the church. And if you can't live the godly life right now when things are okay, don't think that you're going to live godly and you're going to be able to make a, a choice when they have a gun or a sword or whatever, torture, and, and, and looking at that and saying that, oh, well, I'm not going to deny Christ, but you'll deny him. In the face of death, you'll deny him because you're already denying him. Praise the Lord. See, when Jesus was at his very end, he had said in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was at his end. And he said, Father, if it be willing, let this cup pass. That's his flesh. Why? The flesh knew it had to die. And the flesh will do whatever it takes. If there's another, another way out, if there's an easier way, can I take that way? That's what Jesus was saying. Come on. But that was his flesh. But because he had such relationship with God his whole life, then he was able to go and put down the flesh and say, nevertheless, not my will, not the will of the flesh, but the will of the Spirit. Let your will be done. I'll go all the way. Hallelujah. Thank God he did. Yes. But we wouldn't be here today. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Give him a clap offering. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Turn to your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60. I left off with this one. <clears throat> but I want to I look at some things here. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. God is calling the church. This is the call of the church. Say Zion. That's Z-I-O-N, so it's Zion, Zion. What does Zion represent? It's heaven, okay. Where are we at? Where are we spiritually? Physically, we're here. Okay, we're in heaven. Why? Because God has raised us up together and made us sit. I'm giving you scripture now. Ephesians 2, 6. Raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. Heavenly places. <laughs> See, so that's why we are not of this world. We're passing through. The Bible calls us pilgrims. A pilgrim is, they're, just, they're on a journey. And that's what we are. We are on a journey of life. Okay? So now, here's what in our journey, this is what God is saying to us. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee, or upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. That's the word. That's the anointing, the Word of God. Remember, the Word is light. Our light, as Jesus said, he said even of himself, yes, he is the light of the world, but he said, you are the light of the world. And that light is as bright as, you, as us receiving the Word of God and believing the Word of God. As we're walking in obedience to it, our light, that light increases. Our disobedience begins to put out that light. But our obedience keeps us in the light. We have fellowship in the light. Okay? We have fellowship. Now watch. He says, so what does he say to the church? First word. What does it say? Arise. 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 So there is, there is a need for obedience. Arise from what? Arise from where you came from. Arise from your darkness. Arise from your disobedience. Arise and what? Arise and shine. What? 
Let the word shine in us. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Now, who who represent that light? Jesus. Okay, your light has come. The light has come. The, Jesus is the light. He's come already. So now, arise to that light. So you know where you're going. So you understand life. Don't ever think that, I don't know what I'm going to do in life. I don't know what God wants and all. No, the sinner can talk that way. We're not sinners. We're saints. Called out with a purpose. With a destiny. So the only way we're going to know that is that we have to walk in the Word. Okay, now. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee. The glory of the Lord. What do we say the glory was? All that he is. is. Healing, deliverance, freedom, blind eyes to be opened, deaf ears to be unstopped. That's the glory of the Lord. That's the pre- See, when we say the glory of the Lord is showing up, that means there needs to be miracles. The glory of the Lord, miracles. How many miracles are taking place in our churches today in in our country? Very few. Very few. Why? Well, the glory of the Lord hasn't risen. I wonder why. Because the church hasn't arisen. The church is still in their mental state. And they're still drawing from secularism. They're still reaching out for secular help. And then the secular looks at the Christian reaching out for secular help, realizing that their Christians, their God can't even help them. No, it's our faith in believing that God can help them. God can't do it, but he can't, he can do it, but he can't do it when we don't walk in faith. That's why it is impossible to please God without faith. Because everything that we get from heaven comes through faith. Faith is believing what God says. And trusting what God says. And it's not waiting for the results. It walks in the results. Did I go over your head? We don't go and wait till till God shows up. God's already showing up. See, we think that we're waiting on God. No, God's waiting on us. All he's looking for are believers that will believe what he said. That's it. Just believe me. I can imagine how that would frustrate God. You know, he put it all out there. And, and, and Christians are still wondering when they go to pray and they go, okay, well, God, you know, I, I, I feel like you left me. Well, you just believed a lie. Because you don't know what the, God, what the Bible says, that he won't leave you. He won't forsake you. Well, God, I, I hope you find it in your heart to heal me. No, see, then we really don't believe what he says. That can be frustrating. It's like your child comes up to you and asks you for something, and, and, and he says, yeah, I'm going to give, I'll give it to you, I'll give it to you. And they come up again a, a two minutes later and ask you again. And then two minutes after that, ask you again. And give me, it's like, wow, they really don't trust me. Unless you lied to them before. But see, God's not like us. God says what he, sa- says what he means and means what he says. And he says, my word doesn't return void. When he said he's going to do something, he will do it. But you got to believe it. So if you get a child to go and say, okay, I believe it. You know why? Because he's done it before. They came through every time. So, okay, I will rest in that word. He says, I'll give it to you. Just wait a little bit. I'll give it to you. And so they rest in that word and they go on with life. They go on and play. Why? I'm going to get it. Praise the Lord. (laughs) Look funny at me. Now watch, behold, this is what we need to pay attention to. Behold, the the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness. What is that? 
deep darkness, the people, but the Lord will arise over you. Now, we are coming into the dark, and it's getting darker. But God's people are going to become brighter. And when people are in the dark and they want to get out of the dark, they will see the light and they will go after the light. People are going to start to come after you if you are consistent in your faith. If you go in and out, in and out, that, then they're not going to come to you because they go in and out themselves. But when they see consistency in there, people say, well, I love my family, I love my kids, and I love, but yet they're inconsistent in their faith. Do you really love them? Don't tell me that I don't love them. Well, then show them. Show them. They need to see consistency. They need to see not only saying that you love them. That's easy to come to somebody and say, I love you, and never prove it. God proved it to us through his son, Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave. He sacrificed his son to prove his love toward us. And we go and we say, oh, do you, do you love your children? But yet you go out and do what you want to do. Because that's what your children are going to do. Going to do what you do. And you're going to cause them to split hell wide open. That doesn't show me that you love your kids. That shows me that you hate them. Either love or hate. Which one? <laughs> Praise God. My, I thank God about the testimony that I have with my kids. We're consistent. Robert and Hazel, well, they're still serving God. After all these years, they're still serving God. They've been married 44, 44 years and, and, and still serving God. Hallelujah. I mean, Pastor Robert may have gotten out a little bit, but here, here he's come back in church and, and pastored again. But even between that time, you're still serving God. That's the testimony. We didn't go off. Do we want to go off? Sure. Do we want to give up on our, on our marriage? Sure. A lot of people do. We could have any time. But we didn't. We just stayed in there. And when we go and tell people how long we've been married, it goes, that's unheard of. That's sad. Because years ago, it wasn't. People knew what commitment meant. People knew that when you put your hand to the plow, they didn't look back. They said, this is for life. This covenant. We're going all out. Praise God. But I'm going to tell you, to be honest with you, we would have never made it without God. Because we would have gone off just like everybody else. The only thing that made the difference is that we had our convictions before God. And that kept us going. As long as we kept going after God, we stayed together. And, and, not, and not, in, not go and do this, gritting our teeth. Well, I stayed with you, long, woman, long enough now, you know, or, uh uh no. Now, if we get, we're, we're better off today than we ever have been. We're enjoying life now. Now we're finally, get, we're finally on the same page, aren't we? We're finally on the same page. <laughs> yeah. I always, I always say this whenever I talk, counsel the couples, and sometimes you'll go to the, to the husband or something and say, oh, well, how's your marriage going? How's it going? Oh, good, good. Uh, let me go talk to your wife. Because I'll tell them the truth. Really what's going on, you know. You want to know, if you want to know the temperature of, and, and that's a gauge, temperature there in a relationship, just consult the wife. Amen. Right? right? Well, you know, I can't make her happy. Yeah, but if you're a scoundrel, I mean, I can see that nobody can be happy around you. <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> you're not even happy with yourself. That's the reason why you got an attitude. Right? Nobody wants to live with that attitude, and you're having a hard time with it. That's the reason why you're grouchy. <laughs> Just get out of it, grouch. <laughs> Change your attitude. Well, you know, I'm just tired, and I just... Uh, we always give an excuse. Always. There's no excuse for ugly. <laughs> oh, my God, did I say that? Wow. 
You know, it's up to you. You get ugly inside, it comes out. It also distorts your face. <laughs> because what's going on inside here is the continence of our, of our face. The Bible even says that. You know, so if I'm going to change this, I need to change this. Come on. Yeah. And don't just come in the church and put your Jesus smile, and then your husband and wife look at you, you little fake. I know how you really are. It's like, wow, that's the reason why I kept working at it and working at it because, man, I was a preacher and I'm ministering the word. And then if I go over there and look, turn over to my wife, I wouldn't look over there. But there'd be dagger eyes. I mean, it's like, I, we got to get some things straightened out. So let me tell you. But I think most of, I think it was only one time, maybe, if I can remember correctly. Didn't get it right. I was over ministering the word, I was te teaching on temptation. And here I was yielding to temptation, <laughs> temptation to want to get upset, and, uh, and which I did. But we made it right later on. The thing is, I hate it. Because you know what? I want to be real. Man, come on. Some preachers can do it, but I can't. I want to be real. But I want to be real in front of her. That's, right. That's what I want to be real in. Because nobody else sees me, but she sees me. And I want to be real. I want to make sure that how I live in front of people in public is how she sees me live. And the only way I can make that happen is that I have to keep humble before God and bow myself before the Lord and God and say, God, help, help me. I realize it's, it is about me. It is my issues. She may, have, she may provoke them, but that's, she's got some things. <laughs> she has some things, but you know what? That's not my part. My part is not to change her. Her part is not to change me. My part is to change me. You see, and when God, and when we do that, then God gets in there. But when we start blaming, he's out of it. He's out of the picture. You're on your own. And I used to hate those times I would be on my own because I know what the Bible says about relationship. And I look at that and I said, you know, my prayers are hindered. And it's like, oh my God, you know, I don't want to say I'm sorry yet. I'm just upset. I'm just suing in it and all this. And, and, and then I want to go to God and talk with God and I can't. Why? Because he doesn't hear my prayer. He doesn't hear our prayer. Read it. I think it's in Peter. Our prayers are hindered. And so what I need to do is that I need to get it right. I need to go, as even Jesus says, to go and leave your gift there and leave it there at the altar and then come and make it right. Whoever it is, your spouse, your friends, whoever, make it right and then come back and then offer your gift before God. <laughs> so that's why I used to get in between and I get so frustrated and stuff and it's like, oh, so eventually, I, you know, I did, and then I said, okay. And then I would say, it's the woman each time until I realized that it wasn't the woman, it was me. I was the problem. Now, she, of course, has to go herself in saying that she's the problem, but I can't tell her she's the problem. You understand what I'm saying? That's good word. You know, because then we go right back at the beginning what Adam did with Eve. And God told Adam, hey, what's up? What's up with our relationship? Well, it's a woman. He blamed God for the woman he, cre he created for him. He says, no. He said, he could have he fixed it up. God gave him all the responsibilities. It's amazing how men want to be, be the leader, but when it comes to responsibilities, it's the woman. Really? You know, so when I go and I put blame on the man, and I start telling him all his responsibilities, and I say, you still want to be the leader? He says, in order to be a man, you got to be a leader. But a leader means you got more accountability. Come on. And guess what? You can't be a man without God. Right. I couldn't be a man without God. So I needed God to be a man and quit sniffling. I know my wife was tough. I can never show myself and show all my weaknesses and stuff because she has some th things there too herself. And so what I do is I have to go to God every time. But it, actually it did justice for me because it forced me to go to God to become strong. So, because if I get weak, she falls. She starts falling too. So I always, I don't show any weakness. Do I, do I experience weakness? Yeah, I just need God. 
I just go to God every time I go to God, but it's done something in me. It's, it's caused me to become so dependent on God. Praise God. So when I have some areas there that I'm weak and I feel struggles and all, I just go to God, man. God, come on now. It's just you and I. And let me tell you, God is always faithful. But he made, made a man, made, made me into a man that I never dreamed would be possible because of the things I came from. And therefore, I love myself. I'm not in love with myself. Okay, I love myself. I'm in love with Jesus. Hallelujah. See, but I, I love myself. And because I love myself, I'm able to love more effectively those around me. See, because if you don't love yourself, you can't love anybody effective because your love goes like this, up and down. It wavers too much. But when you love yourself, you'll, you can love people even if they don't love you back. You can still love them. Why? Because you're in love with Jesus and you're totally satisfied and content. Amen. Amen. You know, I was just thinking about it. I'm going by the Spirit right now, okay? There's some things here. But I was thinking, I was telling my wife earlier, I said, you know what? There's so many Christians, I don't even want their faith. I don't even like their faith. Wow, wow, don't look at me like that. I says, I says because I wouldn't want their life. I like the life that God's bringing me into. But the reason why I like it is because I keep feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. Hallelujah. And it causes me to rise above my issues and my problems. So instead of looking at the problem and letting the problem be, I become that problem, then what happens is that I look at that problem and keep it separate from me so I'm able to see clearly of what the solution should, should be. So I get to live this, and I used to think that that's going to run out. You know, somewhere it's going to, something's going to hit, and something's going to hit, and it's going to throw me into a tailspin and all. But I've been doing this for, for years already. And have we been hit? Yeah, we have been hit. But I never went into a tailspin like I used to. I'm giving you some answers now. Come on. And so th this is the reason why, wow, really, it really works. I just feed myself spiritually, constantly feeding myself, constantly putting in, just putting in. And then, and then my wife the other day, she, she was talking on the phone, she was talking to our daughter, and, and I, I talked a little bit, but you know, the women, they go talking and stuff, and after a while, you know, I put the TV on pause, because we were watching TV, I put the TV on pause, Hallmark, <laughs> and uh, romance, comedy, you know, whatever, anyways, I went and, and I said, well, I'm not, I want to just sit here and waste time. So what I did is I got up and went over there and got into my word and just started reading the word. Just reading that word, putting it in. And I started worshiping God a little bit. And when she finished, I just walked over there and continued. I don't want to waste time. He said, man, you're really fanatical. Yeah, but I like my life. Come on. I like what it's doing. I like how what is continually transforming me as it causes me to become strong. So when I do face the negativity of life, I'm able to face it. And I look at it and say, oh my God, here we go again. I don't have to look at it that way. Because then when if I act that way, the enemy says, oh, I got you. So I'm going to ride you on that. See, the enemy's tactic. He sees our reaction on the outside. He, sees, he hears what we say, and he knows how to act based on what we say. Oh, come on, Pastor, just get real. That's just life that we just say things like that. Just say what you want to say. Go ahead. How's that working for you? <laughs> Even your own body responds to what you say. It, you have a choice to release the right kind of chemicals in your body if you say the right things. Yes, Jesus. Because I don't, I don't, don't know anybody who goes and says, oh, I'm just depressed, or I'm just discouraged, or, or I'm just this, or I'm just that. Guess what? Your body's going to respond to it, and you're going to feel it. I have never in my life, even as a little kid, I never was bored, but I hear kids today, they're bored. You know why they're bored? It's the responsibility of the parent to put the kids to work. 
responsibilities in the home. Don't you throw the trash out yourself if they're old enough to throw the trash out. Don't you do it. You're enabling them. You're teaching them. And then that's the reason why we have a generation that have a sense of entitlement. I'm entitled. I have a right. You have a right to do this for me. Wow. They come to God and expect that out of God also. Man. No wonder they have problems with their faith because then God doesn't act the same way as some parents do. And He isn't given what the, some parents do. So then guess what they want to do? They don't want to serve God. Because God gives us a responsibility that we're supposed to keep and we're supposed to maintain. I've seen parents that just say, well, you know what's easier for, for me to do it myself? Wow, really? The reason why I wasn't bored, and one thing about it, my parents did some bad stuff and everything like that, but thank God they got saved and, and all, after I was already older, of course, but... Anyways, there was good things that they did. Responsibilities, man. I had, even as a little kid, growing up, pick up your room, do this, do that, make sure. And, and I had to do that. I'd take out the trash. I, and I would go over there, and I had to do all the, the mowing of the lawn on our house. Take care of the outside. You know, I washed dishes. I washed morning, noon, and dinner. Dishes. I don't see those happening to kids today. Really. <laughs> then when God goes and says he doesn't act like the parents, then he goes and says, he goes and says, uh, uh, I don't, uh, like I said, I don't want to serve God. I don't want to live for God. Oh, no, no, no. Watch your son. He's going. <laughs> <laughs> cut it. I ain't going to cut it. I'm going to go on. I mean, that's, I mean, I, mean I, I was taking care of things, and I even took pride in it. I was taking pride in it. I look at the lawn. I had the best-looking lawn of the whole block. Maybe one. I think there was one. It was a gardener. But, I mean, I looked at it, and I edged it, and I mowed it, and I watered it, and make it nice and green. It was one of the greenest lawns there in the block. I took pride in that. I liked it, but it taught me responsibilities. It taught me to grow up. See, when we're bored, we have, a, we have a lack of direction. It all starts in the home. Praise the Lord. So when they go to serve God and they choose God, then God gives them responsibilities, they can go and flow with it. And they won't buck it. They won't resist it. This generation are a lot of goats <laughs> amongst our, our young, young generation. Goats. They have been taught responsibilities. Why do you think they have so much living off of government? They make a living out of it. Why do I need, you know, I could just bend the elbow and bored. You get bored. I have never in my life been bored. From a kid growing up, never in my life been bored. To this day, I never get bored. Sure is quiet. Maybe I better <laughs> cut it, huh? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but no, I don't want to apologize. Parents need to straighten out. Parents need to, this is all has to do to be to live a godly life. And if you're going to lead your kids to live a godly life, you need to teach them responsibilities and you need to make sure they carry it through. Don't be lazy. Follow through with it all the way. That's where the work is at. That's why they say it's easier for me to do it myself than to, than to have them do it. You know, how else are they going to learn? Where are they going to learn? When are they going to learn? Come on. They're not. They're not. The world is going to eat them up alive. Because they never ex experience any kind of conflict. Well, you don't understand that my, you know, and this is what I hear a lot. I, I'm a counselor. I hear this. Well, you know, my kids, uh, they didn't have a dad or a dysfunctional mom or something, you know. So I have to make up the difference. They may not say it, but they do it. And what you're doing is you're harming them. 
See, because you have to live for today, not live for yesterday. Because the kids are smart and they'll use that yesterday against you for leverage. Wow. <laughs> I like this, huh? <laughs> yeah, do you like this, parents? Amen? Yeah. That was a little weak. I'm trying to make a strong church here. It all starts with the family. The structure in the family, a foundation in the family, a strong family. You know, and if you're one of the parents that have fallen, fallen with what I'm telling you, then what you need to do is repent before God because it needs repentance and start putting it to work and don't think it's too late. You need to do it right away. Just do it. Oh, that's going to be really hard. They're going to act out and all. Let them act out. It's better to act out in front of you than act out in front of a cop. <laughs> Man, it's hard for me to get off of that. But I'm going to do you a favor and get off a little bit. <laughs> oh, it's talking about gross darkness. I mean, sometimes we add to that. Gross darkness. See, so what needs to do is that we need to step up to our responsibilities of what God has called us to do and, st and start becoming obedient. But we need to be an example to those around us. And parents, you need to be an example to your children. They, they see you. They watch you. If you go and you, you go and you praise God and worship God in church and then you go home and then you go and you just start yelling at your kids and tell them this and that and all that, they see two people. That's, that's mixed messages. Well, I like you when you're over there worshiping God and all, but, you know, I, I like that mom or I like that dad, you know, and stuff. And, you know, when you get home, I'm scared. Or I get, you get home, it's like, man, you're inconsistent. So then what happens, it breeds in them because they're going to protect themselves. It breeds in them rebellion. And then we get upset because they're stubborn and rebellious and don't realize what we did. Because our kids are only a product of what we made them. Man, I can't get off. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's get, let's get, let me show you something here. The behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, deep darkness of people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his, his glory, his glory will be seen upon you. His glory. Okay. What the world needs to see is God. They need to see Jesus. All right? That's the glory. Now, what part of his glory are we going to allow them to see? I want to see the whole thing. There's something that, I'll just say, Mark gave me some kind of plaque and said that, uh, uh, behold, um, but all things are possible with God. And I'll, uh, I had to find out. He wouldn't tell me. Nobody told me, so I found that out. I looked at Will, and it's, well, who did this right here? Who put this on my desk? You know, and, all, and he's over there. He was drinking. I don't know where he was drinking, but anyways, he was there, and he starts standing up, and he goes, oh, I'm going to go. You see it all over his face. You know, I said, hey, hey, get back over here. Let me ask you something. And then he goes, and he starts, and he says, well, you know, I just look at the cameras. I ain't going to look at the cameras. You tell me. And so I, I made a guess. I guessed something, and then I guess the second guess was you. Wasn't the second guess him? You know? And then he goes... I mean, you want to give it a secret to him? <laughs> He'll show it all in his face. <laughs> it was funny. But anyways, that, that sign there I liked, you know, and, and it's really because the glory of the Lord is really revealing the bigness of God, and that's what I want to picture, give you that kind of picture, the picture of the bigness of God, how big God is. Show a certain situation that rises up, well, God's bigger than that. You know, a, a problem rises up, well, God's bigger than that. You know, a person has need of healing or something. Well, God's bigger than that. That's the way we need to respond. That's the glory of God rising up on the inside of us. When somebody presents a problem, okay, let's, let's, just, let's, think, let's think this through. Let's pray this through. Let's, you know, because there's a solution. Anytime, anytime there is a problem, there's always a solution. It's asking for a solution. 
Anytime there's a problem in relationship, the problem is there because it's looking for a solution. There is a solution to every problem. Why? Because we serve of God that is all things are possible. Amen. All things are possible to them that believe. I believe. I believe. That's why I cannot bow down to the problems of life. I cannot. I cannot. Now when I serve a big God, we talk about the big God, but when we come into a problem, oh man, I'm depressed. Oh man, I'm just bummed out. Oh man, I'm just discouraged. What? You just talked about how big God was. That means that you talk about it, but you don't believe it. It's got to go further than what we just talk about. We've got to talk about what we believe. It's got to believe, be, become our belief no matter what. Even if it doesn't look good, and it leaving, if, even if it's getting worse, still look at the bigness of God. Hallelujah. Because God is faithful. Now, we cannot look at the bigness of God when we are so caught up with life. I'm going to read this, Luke chapter 21, verse uh, 34, and I'm going to read it from the Amplified Version. And, uh, and, and listen closely what this, this, Jesus is giving warning. He's giving warning. You talked about the end times, but now he's giving warning here. He says, take heed to yourselves. Be on your guard. Lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed and weighed down with a giddiness and he headache and nausea of self-indulgence, drunkenness, and worldly worries and cares pertaining to the busyness of this life, and lest that day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose, a snare. Wow, that's a lot. What is he saying? Take heed. Be sober. Be careful. Be aware. How are you going to be, become aware? You're going to have to be aware through prayer. Now watch. He says, don't be overburdened and depressed with what? With the things of this world. Because we're going to be so caught up with the busyness of life. See, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. If you're too busy to get into the Word, you're too busy. I can't afford to be too busy. I can't afford it. It's a matter of life and death, and we have to look at it in that way. It's a matter of life and death. The life of God moving in through my life. What I cannot allow. You are resp Let me tell you, say this. If you're too busy, God didn't make you busy like that. You got busy because of the choices that you made. You don't know how to organize because you don't know how to prioritize. But our prioritizing takes place based upon where our heart is at. And if our heart is connected to the heart of God, then everything around you will surround it will surround around that. You know what? I can't do this. Nope, I can't go there. No, nope, I can't go to that meeting. Let me tell you, because you know what? It takes away. You don't have to tell anybody that. Just know that for yourself. It takes away from me. I'm going to be so wiped out. I ain't going to have time for God. Oh, yeah, but I pray when I, when I move around and I pray. That's good. I do that too. But I also take the time out of busy, busyness just to give time to meditate upon God. Meditate upon His Word. Ponder Him. Think about Him. Thank Him. Thank Him for my life. Thank Him for victory. Thank Him for, thanking Him for redeeming me. You'll always find something to thank God in. I should have put you on, on blast. <laughs> yeah. 
You think so, huh? <laughs> yeah, if you got a droid, you can do that. There. Uh, how'd you like that? <laughs> Now, don't get me off here now. <laughs> now, notice, we can get so busy, and all of a sudden, I believe this is really what has happened to the body of Christ today. All these laws that have been passed, the Christian just sat back. Lazy. You got problems. I know Christians that have so many problems. They got this problem. They got that problem. They're dealing with this problem. You know what? You're always going to have problems. But either you're, there's two things. You're either under the problem or you're above the problem. And the Bible calls us to, he, he says this, God's word says that he raised us up. But he also called us eagles. Eagles fly high. Okay? That's when they fly above the storm. We, we got to fly above the storms. I'm going to teach on that one day. But what Isaiah says, you shall wait upon the Lord. They shall renew as, as eagles. They shall mount up as eagles. Right? But see, this is where God wants us to come into. But I see so many Christians that are just down here. And then you go and you tell them and you encourage them and all, and they get a little encouraged there, and then when they leave you, they're back down there again. Because you know what? You can't help walk people out. They have to walk it themselves. They have to choose to walk it. Amen? See, what's going to happen? Suddenly things start to happen and look around and say, oh my God, I didn't realize this happened. You don't, let's go back for a moment. You, go, you don't go and take care of your kids and do what they need to do and teach them responsibility. Then when, the next thing you know, when it's time to do it, they're older. And they tell you what to do. Because you never told them what to do, they tell you what to do. Come on. How many of you had teenagers? They do. Praise the Lord. Oh, well, I, don't, I can't help it. You know, I didn't have a father in the house or a mother or whatever. I says, no, 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 that's no excuse whatsoever. No excuse. Not when you have God. Mothers, if you, if you, have, if you have God, God, God could be your husband. Totally. But you need to pay attention to what he's saying. <laughs> Watch what it says. In fact, that word giddiness I said giddiness. Giddy is silly. Just acting silly. How many people act silly? You know, I'm going to lay hands on you. No. <laughs> no, but you know, sometimes we just want to go silly, silly. I remember, now listen, listen to this. I remember there's a certain person that we used to, we were friends with. I think we remember this couple. He used to always laugh at everything. And, I, and he'd come over to the house to our apartment, actually, and, and we, our kids were little, and their kids were little, almost the same ages, and, and they'd come over, and the kids would play, and then we, and I'd talk, and I'd give him, I'd give him the gospel, and he'd just smile. He, he, in fact, his look, good-looking guy, young guy, he, he looked, well, we were all young, but anyways, uh, he looked like a guy on chips, Pavarello chips, Eric Estrada, yeah, and, uh, and so he would just laugh. Just laugh at it and just stuff like that. Uh, a few years later, he got a divorce and remarried, but he was in bed. He died in sleep. And I thought, wow. Good chance he went without. I don't think he's smiling today, you know? And I says, wow. I remember talking to another guy who was over there. He had been involved with the drugs, or he was involved with drugs, but anyways, I was ministering and talking to him about Jesus, and I said, I says, hey, hey um, uh, uh, you, need to, you need Jesus and this and that. And he says, oh, I already tried that. I've, d I've been there before. And I, he says, well. Then I looked at him and I says, well, then you're like a dog that turns to his vomit and licks it up. I told him that. <laughs> I was a young Christian. And, and, so, and so anyways, uh, he goes. And, and, and the next day, the next day I went and I, and, and I, I inquired, where is he? And he goes, oh, he died in his sleep. No, but it was overdose. And I says, wow. And I thought thinking, that was the last call. I was his last call. And there's other testimonies that I've had that, that people have done that and, uh, and I minister to them dying on their dying beds. And I think, it, you know what? It's not a joke. 
It's not a joke. I don't take it as a joke. I, I think of these people that are movie stars and stuff like that, and I, I start looking them up and see if they're any Christians, you know, when they die. You know, what kind of life? And it's like, oh, my God. You know, I think about eternity a lot now, you know, because this is not what life's all about. Th this, is, this, is, this is the place where we learn, okay? And, and then we take into eternity. And so when people die and we have loved ones, and then they go and they, and funerals, and funerals, they go, oh, well, you know what? Uh, I can see, this, look, they're, they're looking down from heaven. And they never lived the life. Never lived the life. People are afraid to say the truth. They butter it all up. And so and so, they live like the devil, but they're down from heaven looking down on me. It all sounds good for the person personally, but is it true? That's the part is. What is this? To be absent, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord if you're a believer. But to be absent of the body is to be present in the place you don't want. None of us want to go. Okay? See, so the thing is, we as Christians got to become serious because there are people around us that are dying and you don't, they don't have to wait till they're old. They're dying when they're young. And so what are we doing? Are we letting them go? We need to get serious and start looking to minister to them the life that God has in us. That God's doing in us. God would let God move in your life. Let him do it. Let him do what he needs to do. Straighten it out. If you love your if you love your families, if you love your children, let him do what he needs to do in you because you are may the you may be the only Jesus they see. We need to get their we need to get the heart of God. And the heart of God is. You, they, God loves your family and your kids more than you ever will. Come on. So we need to get that love inside of us. But we're blocked if we get so busy with life. It blocks us when we can't. We, we don't see anybody else. We don't see, oh, so-and-so died. Oh, well. So-and-so died. Yeah, well, they died. Oh, I'm sorry. You know. It's like, wait a minute. Where'd they go? Where'd they go? We need to look and stop. You know what? I could have been the one influencing them. I could have said something to them, but I never said anything to them. Wow. What we need to do at that point, if you missed it, I mean, I mean, you're not doomed. If you missed it, we need to go and say, well, God, I'm sorry. Help me, to, help me to be sensitive to those that are going to go without you, that don't know you. Help me so I can be sensitive to that. I've been asking, asking the Holy Spirit to be, I want to be sensitive to be able to minister to people on the outside, people that need to know, people that need to hear. I want to be sensitive. I want to be sensitive to their needs. I want that in my life. I don't want to just go, come to church, minister the word, and just go and go to that mission and minister there. I need to be sensitive to people around me. Because sometimes we get so busy, oh, I ain't got time for you, and I got to go. And you know what? They'll probably take their life next day. It's like, how are you going to feel? No, we need to be, we need to be open. We need to not, 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 to be, to be, not get too busy. And we, we need to be thankful. So when you go and you have, to, you have, uh, uh, Thanksgiving with your family, be a light. Amen. Be a light. We, I'm going to continue with this message, but we need to get in there and get a hold of God and no more plane. Window of opportunity. No more plane. Let's get in there. This church, if, it, if people will get all that same heart, this church will not lack seats. Fill the seats. Get ready to go into an, a, a building. Get it up. Fill it up. Right? Are your hearts there? Amen? Amen? Then we need to shake yourself from the things of the world and the problems of life and quit, quit gri griping, complaining. Quit doing that. Stop and think about it. Jesus, wasn't that good enough? Jesus redeemed us, paid the price, bought us. Praise God. Isn't that right there good enough to just praise God and thank God and have a, thank, a thankful heart and be excited about life? 
in spite of what's going on in your life, just be excited about life. It'll turn your attitude and you'll rise above the problems that you're facing right now. Because don't want, if you don't want any problems, then you got to die and go to heaven. Okay, that, that's your answer. But that's just not going to try, may, may not happen. Okay, so guess what? You better enjoy the journey and rise above your problems. That's where I live. So I'm inviting you where I live. Amen. You don't have problems? Sure, I got problems. But it's not inside here, it's out there. I keep it separate off of me. So I don't have to go around saying, God, I wish this was this way. Oh, I wish that. Oh, I wish I could have this. Oh, I wish. No, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. Stand to your feet. Praise God. Totally didn't go the direction I would think it was going to go, so I just go wherever the flow is and praise the Lord. And, and, and I just think that some of you needed, needed to hear what was being said today. And so you're going to go and, and become uh, turned on to Jesus. That was a good response. You get turned on? Get excited about Jesus? Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I could look around and I could see certain things that God's doing, God's working, working on hearts. Um, I can probably call you out different ones, but you know what, I'm, I'm going to let the God do it because God, what God has started, God's going to continue to do it. But there's things that God is talking to you. He's speaking to you. I would really encourage you to just, whatever you're holding on to in your life, if it stands in the way, if it's a hindrance, it's not worth it. Because I'm telling, uh, you know what? We go to sleep every night, don't we? Every night we go to sleep. 